keyifli olduğunuzu umuyorum. Ee, şimdi sırada Oscar Yaşar konuşmacımız sağ olsun bizi kırmadı. Türkiye'de ilk defa konuşacak ve e, onunla birlikte e, yaklaşık 30 senelik bir tecrübesi var. Birazdan e, detaylı olarak, olarak tanıtacağım kendisini. E, i̇leriye yönelik olarak yatırımcı ilişkilerinin nasıl bir potansiyeli olabileceği konusunda e, önemli çalışmalar yapmış Farid Vaziyet'te. Bizim için de bayağı bir ışık yakabileceğini düşünüyorum. Motivasyonel bir e, seans olacak diye düşünüyorum. E, Oscar konuşmasından sonra e, soruları alacak. Dolayısıyla ilk önce kendisini dinleyelim. Ondan sonra da e, soru cevap seansına geçelim. Sorularınızı lütfen iletin kendisine. So Oscar, welcome. We are very happy to have you here today. Uh, Oscar is regarded as the global leader in executive recruitment within investor relations and corporate communications. And he's the author of the groundbreaking report, which showcases the significant transformation in the reputation of IR and how it's now being viewed as a platform for the next generation of business leaders. And he will talk about it with us now. Oscar has nearly 30 years of experience in both investor relations and corporate reputation advisory, helping some of the world's largest companies on their communication to the financial capital markets, and in investor relations headhunting, where he's helped to place more than 360 senior investor relations and communications professionals globally. <laughs> Oscar has lived in London all his life, you might have guessed he's actually a quarter Turkish. And as he says, unfortunately, he's also a quarter French, Russian, and Georgian. But fortunately, he's British yes. through and through. And still, he has not chosen to stay there and vote for Brexit, but join us today, which I hope you have been enjoying. So along with his partner, David Broom, he's also, who's also with us today, Oscar is also the author of the soon-to-be-published new book, Stand Out or Stand Aside, The Power of Professional Personal Branding, which he will also talk about. So I will now, without further ado, pass it on to Oscar. Thank you, Oscar, Thank for you being with us much. today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Asana, for that incredibly warm uh, introduction. And uh, it gives me enormous pleasure to be here with you all this afternoon at what has been I think quite an extraordinary investor relations conference, um, full of energy, hugely sophisticated, uh, really forward thinking. And I think it most definitely showcases the significant transformation of investor relations in this, in this great country of ours. And I do say ours because, again, I'm a quarter Turkish, uh, but thankfully this speech will be given in English because the only Turkish I know I learnt as a little child listening to Emel Sion and Bülent Ersoy and Waz Zabajur and Kaya Han the singers. So unfortunately, the only Turkish I know is about lost love and melancholy. So we won't go there. But uh, but um, also my father, my great, my brilliant grandfather taught me one thing, and that's to say, "Nemutlu çeyrek Türküm diyene" is the only thing I can actually say. I don't know what that means, but uh, <laughs> if I may also take this uh, unique opportunity on behalf of the the, the delegates and the esteemed guests and the esteemed dignitaries to really congratulate Asla Hanum and uh, Bülent Bey and Başak Hanum and Serkan Bey and the rest of the team here at TUT for putting on what has been quite a remarkable investor relations conference. 20 years ago I was in Turkey, I worked on the IPO and the privatization of Turkcell and from a standing start of almost nothing 20 years ago to being one of the most robust, one of the most energetic, and I genuinely think one of the most sophisticated investor relations markets globally. So I must really uh, commend you all. And again, by way of introduction, um, I started in investor relations, uh, strategic communications, gosh, nearly 30 years ago. I had a lot of hair 30 years ago. I had a lot of big black Turkish hair 30 years ago. and. Um, and 15 years ago, I made what I thought would be a, a sensible transition into investor relations headhunting. Because in the UK, I could see the first 
shoot of the transformation of investor relations. I could see it was becoming much more sophisticated. I could see it was becoming much more critical to a company's positioning in the capital markets. And since then, as Asahan points out, I've helped more than 360 directors of IR to get their jobs globally. And um, standing here in front of you all, I think, reminds me of my first ever investor relations conference um, 15 years ago in the UK. As I stood up, I think, with some confidence and I think a huge amount of naivety, and I pointed to people in the room because I could see that there was this significant transformation in the world of investor relations. And I said pointedly that in five or 10, 15 years time, that a number of you in this room are going to become not only the, the next directors of corporate affairs, not only the next directors of corporate development, not only the next directors of strategy, but also the next CFOs and the CEOs. Now, I think the reaction was quite interesting. I think a few, few people at the back uh, laughing and a few giggles here and at one stage I thought I was going to be taken back in a straight jacket and uh, given 100 lashings and told never to say those words ever again. And you know what happened? This happened. There are now countless examples of former investor relations directors who've made the transition into senior business leadership functions. There are countless examples of people like you 15 years ago who made that transition. Uh, good morning, everybody, and a very warm welcome uh, to this morning's breakfast session from Investor Relations to Business Leader, The Pathway to CEO. Gone are the days, as I say, where IR was deemed to be back on its function. This event, I think, and the report uh, will encourage a number of IR directors out there to really to view their career as a potential launch pad into a senior business leadership function. For me, the, the key to all of that was actually really getting to grips with the detail of the business, the business model, the value drivers, and spending a lot of time close to the business, so getting engaged with mergers and acquisitions, business transformations, regulation, crises, all of which I think gives you a really in-depth understanding of the business and that helps you to position yourself to make that transition. And I actually think that all of us in this room are business leaders and actually 99% of people outside of you know, a business would see us as business leaders. Understand the business, understand how it works, understand how it makes money, the, the operating model, the strategy, the market. And if you can do that, and that equips you to have different types of conversations with CEOs and CFOs, and they realise that you're capable and, and, and able to, to operate at a different level, I think that's what gives you the springboard into the bigger roles. You have a lot of skills in IR, you know, analytical skills, strategic skills, communication skills, relationship building skills. I think leave anyone in a sort of good position to uh, broaden out your portfolio. Be prepared to have very honest conversations with uh, you know, people in the business who are more senior or who can influence your career about what competencies you need to develop and then actually gain the um, sponsorship and the backing to develop those competencies. I encourage you to contribute as broadly as possible because really um, you, you have licence to get into almost any part of the business you want. You have licence to have opinions on almost any, any aspect of the business you want. I think investor relations sits in a unique position in the business. You have your finger in every pie across the business. You get an external perspective from investors and, and analysts, which again can be quite challenging. I think that gives you a unique set of skills to be able to take that forward as a leader within the business. The thing, most important thing that you take away from this panel meeting is that anything is possible, that these IR directors in this room can become the CFOs and the CEOs of the future. So there we have it. Um, I'm equally confident that the future of investigation in this great country of ours is incredibly bright because I know that there are a few of you amongst us who can potentially become the next generation of business leaders. So as the title suggests uh, and shouts out at us, the driving value through change. Uh, we don't want to look back at what we've achieved as a group, but also look ahead and be able to visualise the impact that we can make as a profession, but also for you 
as individuals becoming the next generation of business leaders. But I also wanted to stress that there are a number of you in this room who want to become or remain in restorations directors for the rest of your careers, and that is fantastic. But I hope this afternoon's short presentation will give us the confidence to really understand that Investorations is now a critical platform for the next generation of business leaders. And I hope we showcase this here today. Over the next few minutes, I'm hoping you'll agree that it will be a journey really into a fascinating area which a significant number of my candidates appreciate, and that's their own careers. So this afternoon, what I'm going to do is run through briefly with you the background to this report, which is the third in a series of our reports, showcasing the transition from corporate affairs into CEO roles, from IR into CFO roles, CEO roles, as well as corporate affairs and IR into NED roles. I'll also talk about the key findings, the general theme, and the several conclusions which came out of detailed face-to-face -face interviews with the 13 former Investorations officers who'd all made the transition. And I'm hoping this report does resonate with a few of you in this room. And the interesting thing is we published a report last year, and there are two, two females in there, but actually since we published this, the number of females who've become CFOs, also in some cases even CEOs, has doubled. So that ha that's happened within the last 12 months. I'll also um, hopefully give you broader context as to whether this is generally a start of a new trend where these transitions will become even more and more commonplace. What do IRs already bring to the table? But most importantly for you here as an entity, is this going to be the start of a sustained campaign uh, to raise the profile of investor relations directors as potential next CEOs and CFOs of the future? Now this report has made significant traction uh, here uh, in, in the UK, in Europe, as well as the US. I think the, the report which we launched last year at UBS, we had 160 directors of investor relations in one room. Now, that's never really happened before in the UK. So I think that just definitely show, uh, sh showcased to us that there is significant appetite. One thing I'm also going to spend uh, three minutes of your time on this afternoon, something that a lot of my senior candidates never really appreciate, and that's their own personal brand. Um, the power of personal branding, which is something incredibly critical, that 95% of my senior candidates are very good at their job, they're very professional, they're very diligent, but actually they, they forget that they have their own personal brand, and they have their own careers that they should also uh, focus on. So if you give me some time later, I'll, I'll go through that with you um, very shortly. So this, again, this isn't just a reputation of uh, the IR industry, but for your careers uh, for the future. So, as we know, investor relations is changing. Um, reputationally, it's changed. Uh, it's now, in the UK in particular, as close to the board as can be possible. We could find really next to no reports that showcase this transition, that showcase the significance of investor relations. Um, and us, for us as a specialist search business, we felt that a particular insight into the leadership career paths of our senior IR directors would be of interest to IR practitioners, and that's definitely the, the, the feedback we've had since we launched this last year. And secondly, we didn't want it to be just about our opinion, because uh, we do have an opinion, but we wanted real-life case studies of individuals who had made the transition into business leadership functions. We also felt the report would be a really critical way to demonstrate the new and exciting pathway. But back to the challenge ahead and why we believe our case studies are the pioneers and that such transitions will become more and more commonplace over the next five or ten years, particularly also in this uh, great country. And the report and the case study suggests that four key components have changed in recent years to ensure that there's really potentially a stronger alignment between the skills gained in investor relations and those of a CEO. Firstly, the world has changed, as, as we know. Um, there's been a, an exp exponential rise in the importance of reputation. 
advocacy, boards need to better manage crises, their corporate reputation, identify personal um, potential risks, and then many more demands now from shareholders, the wider investment community, media, politicians, and also the rise and the power now of social media. I know now in the UK and Europe in particular, CEOs and CFOs now realize that their careers are dependent on how they communicate, not what a good job they're doing. So what do you all bring to the table? Again, an ability to build a narrative, vision, calm in a crisis, the wherewithal to, in effect, to connect the dots and build trust, the ability to multitask, juggle many balls at the same time, communicate succinctly, managing comple complex stakeholder groups, managing those above you and managing those below you. Now, all of these were deemed by the interviewees to be critical in their development, critical on their path to becoming a CEO and a CFO. And I thought it might be useful just to highlight some top-line thoughts from a couple of the other participants in the report, which I do encourage you to read. It's on our website. Um, these were some of the individuals who took part, and I really just wanted to draw out a couple of examples of the thoughts that these individuals had expressed. Firstly, Tony Quinlan. Uh, Tony was uh, the former Investor Relations Director of Marks and Spencers, which uh, some of you probably won't know, is one of the UK's largest re retailers. Um, he started in investor relations there, moved into becoming a CFO of Drax, a large energy provider in Europe, and then he became the CEO of uh, CFO of Drax, then became the CFO of Laird, one of the world's biggest technology companies. And two years ago, Tony Quillen, from the standing start of Investor Relations Director, is now the CEO of Laird. Now, beautiful words to hear 15 years after we've made that prediction that IRs can become the next CEOs. He is now the CEO of one of the world's largest technology companies. And what Tony valued the most uh, from his career in IR was that it really, I think, equipped him with the external perspective that positions such as his now require. And he says, if you've never done an external facing job, the danger is you become accepting to corporate norms. But when your job has been to explain the company and be the, be the touch point to the markets, uh, that challenges great preparation for senior jobs. Now, Andrew Griffith um, is the former um, CFO and CEO of Sky, one of the world's biggest media companies. And um, Andrew's one of the prime examples of someone who's come out of corporate broking, investment banking, to move into IR and then becoming a CFO and CEO. Now, he was going to become the next CEO of Sky until it got acquired last year. He's now actually um, the UK Prime Minister's senior business advisor, and I've known Andrew now for 15 years. Um, and he's actually, obviously, today, some of you will know, there's an election happening in the UK, but I'd much rather be here with you all this afternoon. But um, I think Andrew said that investor relations is really a useful string to your bow, but it's not going to be your only bow. So for him to have come from investor relations to becoming potentially the CEO of one of the world's biggest media companies says a considerable amount. Sue is, again, a prime example. She started her career in investor relations, moved into corporate affairs, then became director of corporate development at SAB Miller, one of the world's biggest brewing companies. And before, obviously, it was taken over by AB InBev. She was the European CEO of AB InBev. The European arm of AB InBev was worth about $30 billion. She was the CEO of that um, company. Sue now sits on a number of boards uh, as an NED, um, particularly in the UK and across Europe. But Sue actually particularly passionately feels that the deep experience she gained, not simply of corporate reputation, but also of commercial operations, very much honed her skills for the roles she now performs. Global trends. Um, 
I definitely think that the UK is very much at the forefront of this transition, um, most notably because of more significant um, regulations in the UK. Obviously, MIFID II was something that was proposed by the UK governments. The US, I think, started 20 years ago, obviously, Sarbanes-Oxley, which some of you might remember. I think some of you might, may have been at school when Sarbanes-Oxley was around. I remember it very, very well. In Europe, this is definitely also gathering pace in that nearly all of our uh, mandates across Europe, the critical thing that HR directors and CEOs, CFOs now ask us for is to find senior IR candidates who have financial qualifications, who are ambitious, and who can potentially be the next directors of corporate strategy and development, and even the deputy CFO. That says a lot, I think, for Europe. Even more exciting, I think there's a significant sophistication in the, the IR marketplace in the Middle East. I was at a conference in the Middle East and I gave a similar speech there. Again, uh, Far East, Asia, um, Singapore and Hong Kong. Incredible markets that really are grasping the importance of investor relations because their senior management are understanding the importance of investor relations. And I am very confident and I predict wholeheartedly that this transformation will also happen in this uh, country, Turkey. And I've met some of the most, again, not just because I'm quarter Turkish, but I'm, I've met some of the most sophisticated IR directors in this room that I've ever met in my whole career. And I know thousands of, of investigations directors. So again, I must commend you all because I know that there are people in this room who have the ambition to become the next CFOs and the CEOs. But also, the thing that really strikes me about the people I've met over the past couple of days here, and the people in this report, and those individuals who are ambitious and career-minded, is they all knew what their personal brand is. And they all knew what they were bringing to the table. So on to personal brand. Um, the power of personal brand, stand out, stand aside. It's an area that uh, fascinated about, um, fascinated about human psychology, and it's now that we at Bloomers are, again, as Arsene Hanlon points out, we are launching, uh, publishing a book next year. I hope, hope you'll buy 200 copies each and give them to your nearest and dearest next year. But it still fascinates me when I ask my senior candidates to talk about their company brand and narrative, and they talk eloquently and they say, oh, I'm very good at doing this and I, my company brand is this and my CEO engagement is this, I've got a great campaigning. Then I ask them, tell me about your brand. And they think, well, and there's an immediate sort of pause and then there's a, a splutter and then there's a sense of silence and honesty that they realize that they've never asked that question of themselves, the power of personal branding. And the, the ir ironic thing is that the common thread that runs through all of these individuals is not only were they ambitious, but they knew exactly what they were bringing to the table. They knew exactly where they were going to go, and they knew exactly how to portray that confidence in any meeting that they had, be it with their bosses or their juniors. This, to me, is something which is significantly important. In today's competitive career landscape, having a strong personal brand is critical. A strong personal brand will transform your career. A weak one could well hold you back. Communications and IR leaders are well used to dealing with brands, their products, services and companies every day. They can discuss their company brand, reputation and narrative with passion and excitement. But when asked to articulate their own personal brand, there is often a look of bewilderment. Many have often neglected their own personal brands. It's the dentist with the poor teeth syndrome. You can forget how to use your professional skills for your own personal benefit, which is often true of many in the communications and IR industries. So what is your personal brand and why is it so important to invest in? Put simply, your personal brand is your reputation. In our industry, everyone understands the value of corporate reputation. Similarly, your reputational personal brand is the constant foundation on which your career is built. 
For many top director roles that we at Brumizar help organisations appoint, there are often a plethora of candidates with the required skills and experience. However, many won't make the shortlist, let alone secure an interview. Why? Because those that are selected understand what makes them distinct. Their business impact, their personal narrative, their USP that makes them enthuse about who they are and what they do. Put simply, they have strong personal brands. Your personal brand will evolve over time. Just like a corporate brand, it needs to be focused and above all, authentic and genuine. The more focused your brand is, the easier it is for people to remember who you are and what you stand for. And it isn't arrogant to understand the key attributes of your personality and professional persona that others appreciate. But it's worth investing time in your own professional development to ensure you actively focus on your own brand and the steps required to ensure that your messaging is consistent. As you articulate and develop your personal brand, think about how it can be promoted. Perhaps it's time to consider accepting invitations to speak at industry events or joining a professional network. Your personal brand should epitomise the values that you represent and when you share it in a conversation, it should automatically raise your energy levels so your audience truly feels it. So the next time you're asked about your personal brand, be prepared. It could be the most important statement you ever make. So therefore, the need for a personal brand, I think it's, uh, it's critical. Critical for people like me who are at the, the coalface of finding senior talent for some of our biggest clients. The need for a personal brand, as we say, is critical and will continue to increase. It's the one thing we think you can take away from it and can follow your, throughout your career. It's a leadership requirement that lets people know who you are and what you stand for. So, to conclude the report, again, even five years ago, um, it was not common for investor relations professionals to even have this discussion about the future of investor relations. But we know things are changing. We've got reports that showcase things are changing outside of Turkey. But what we all need to do, I think, as a, as a profession is, again, come together at events like this. Be proud, I think, of investor relations as a significant role for companies and a powerful platform for the next generation of business leaders. What we have to do, I think, as a group is translate investor relations skills into management talent, management speak, develop broader skills in finance, in commerce, in operations, and really broaden your portfolio internally. Again, professional development, Asla Hanum and I spoke about this earlier, professional development is absolutely critical. 5% of those people that get those big jobs, the funny thing is, ironically, they have been on a lot of professional development courses, they've been on a lot of mentoring courses, and they need a lot of advice. Again, it's very lonely at the top. Identify a mentor, use people externally to gauge from them about their careers and their history. Again, build personal networks. Finally, make a plan. The individuals profiled in this report and others out there is that shows what is possible for talented, uh, talented investor relations professionals who work hard to fulfill boardroom ambitions. So, there we have it. Um, I hope this presentation goes some way really collectively to highlight the significant role that investor relations now is, reputationally, brand-wise, and the future of IR. And put quite simply, I think, the more we come together and bang that drum and wave that flag about how important the role is, then there'll be people up there who'll listen to us. Um, and I'm confident that we'll see many, many more examples of investor relations people in this country becoming the next generation of business leaders. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak at this event and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oscar. My pleasure. And, um, you know, it's certainly very encouraging for us, especially considering we're still at a point where uh, some of our companies need to justify their pure existence mm. to their senior management, you know, let alone being considered for further positions. While at the same time, 
the general manager of Borsa Istanbul, who's uh, our, you know, one of our speakers today, he's actually coming from an IR function. So, as we do see in many things in Turkey, we have uh, examples from both ends. But uh, let's hope the picture is also uh, positive for us going forward. So I will open the question, uh, the floor up for questions, but I will first ask one myself. Uh, how do we strengthen our reputation to be positioned as uh, the next generation of leaders? Maybe it's a good starting point for yeah, the remainder I questions. I suppose the question, I think, uh, intrinsically, is IR professions, of course, investor relations is still a relatively new profession in a lot of companies. A lot of companies still don't understand what investor relations is. The markets actually sometimes don't really understand what investor relations is. But I think critically, what sets people apart, I think, at the top of their game in IR, and you see this when I meet, I meet 20 IR directors a week. I meet people who are amazing, who are brilliant. I meet some people who aren't as amazing, who aren't as brilliant. And one common thread that runs through these individuals that are brilliant and are ambitious is that they all know where they are going. They all say that I'm going to take this opportunity, really maximize it and really make this role as sophisticated as possible, but use that as a platform. So when you go to board meetings, when you meet with um, investors, when you meet with fund managers, when you meet with analysts, it's about actually portraying your image as someone who is critical to the company's success in the financial capital markets. So to answer your question in a very long-winded long fashion, I think it's about really coming together as a group, really understanding that IR is important. The, what's fa what fascinates me about investor relations people is you're so good at what you do, you don't actually look up and see how people view you. And as soon as you start thinking how people can view you, that is the moment that you actually, I think, have power to determine where you're going as investor relations as a career. Um, now, any questions? Yes. Yeah. Get one next. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for the event, first of all. And uh, I have two short questions. The first one: uh, Would you consider to make a study or, uh, you know, brief research with maybe Turkish IR society uh, to, you know, like? Uh, for us to know the Turkish IR professionals, uh, which follow a similar path from uh, being an IR professional uh, to be a, I don't know, a chairman or a CEO, mm. I think this might be a good opportunity uh, to create some en synergy. And uh, the sec second question is, uh, what do you think, what type of skill sets are required for uh, Turkish IR professionals to position ourselves within Europe and maybe in London? Uh, yeah, that's yeah. it. Two very good questions, <laughs> two brilliant questions. The, the first answer is that, uh, yes, I'm so, I mean, I'm, again, I'm a quarter Turkish, but I'm so proud to be a quarter Turkish. And I, because I've seen a significant transformation in the world of IR in this country, we, next year we are going to be publishing a big global report where we're going to be doing company, uh, country by country assessments. And then out of those, out of that big report and have those individual company, a country reports. So that's something we are, we'll be following with you guys. And, uh, and again, I think, as I said right at the start of my presentation, 15 years ago, I had a similar conversation with people in London who didn't really know that IR was a critical function. So to answer your question, yes, we will definitely be, be doing that. And to answer your second question, I think um, what's really important is coming together as much as possible. And this event, I think, has showcased that by coming together and listening to all these great speakers before my presentation, I think it's important that we really understand that IR is a critical function. Um, but having the confidence not just to say that you're a great IRO in the UK, uh, in, in Turkey, but as well as being a great IRO in, in Frankfurt, in Paris, in, in, in London. And there are examples of people who are Turkish who do have speak perfect English, who then can move out to the US, can move out to Asia in particular, can move out to the Middle East. There's a huge growing market for good IR directors in the Middle East, in, in, in Hong Kong and Singapore. So yes, there is, there are, you can definitely take what you've got in Turkey and take that uh, internationally. But one thing actually interestingly is there's been a sense, there's been a real shift in the quality of investor relations over the past 
uh, five or six years. So as a candidate, you need to stand out against the other candidates that are coming from other countries as well. So it's uh, two very good questions, and I'm hoping to work alongside Tuyid next year and many years to come, I'm hoping. Okay. I think there's also, there's also a gentleman just there as well. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Thank you for your virtual presentation, first of all. Okay. Uh, then, so what do you say to those in IR who want to remain in IR for the rest of their careers? Yeah. Thank you. Good. No, so, again, brilliant question. I think, as I said in my um, presentation, I love the fact that people want to remain in IR for the rest of their careers. That's absolutely brilliant because ultimately IR is a, a really great, it's a great career, it's a fantastic profession. But I hope this, this report and the presentation showcases that IR has become a much, much stronger position. So uh, you, can be, you can remain in IR for many, many years and I'm very proud of people in the UK and Europe and America who, particularly actually American, Americans stay in their IR roles for many, many years. Um, that they actually use IR to benefit their teams, they have more power, they have more responsibility, they have more credibility internally. And ultimately, the more credibility you have, the bigger the, the budgets go up, and the bigger the team sizes go up, the bigger your reputation goes up. So absolutely, stay in IR for as many years as you, as you want, but have the confidence knowing that IR is an incredible profession. And that's that confidence that comes from you articulating that. So many more people are going to want to work in IR. In fact, actually, it's interesting that in the UK, I, I, I must receive, my team must receive about 40 or 50 CVs a week from people who are trying to get into investor relations. 15 years ago, I probably got one CV every four weeks from people wanting to come into IR. So because of the reputation of IR in the UK, in, in America, in in Paris and Frankfurt, it's become so much more of, a, of an attractive role because people like you are in IR. It's funny how many more people want to work in restorations, and it's uh, from the report actually. The report has resonated significantly across the, the globe because for the first time people realise actually that IR is a really important profession. I'm, 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 I love the fact that I'm, I'm in IR and really using that to have the confidence to go forward. So fantastic that you want to stay in IR for the rest of your career and let's make the most of it. There's a gentleman. Benim bir sorum vardı. Hazır mikrofon bendeyken sorabilirim. Tabii ki. Hello, thank you for your presentation. It was quite informative for us. I would like to learn about what is the view for investor relations department and its professional from the board level. From the excuse me. From the board level. From board level. It's um, no, it's a, again a, another great question. I think. I mean, five years ago, because CEOs and CFOs' roles were completely different, we know that. There's more regulation in the markets now. There's more demands, as I said in my presentation, um, on boards. I mean, there's so much more potential risk to boards. There's more reputational damage to boards. And therefore, they're taking IR much, much more seriously than they've ever taken IR. So the respect and the value that boards now place on investor relations is, is, is quite fascinating. But within that transition has really happened really only over the past seven or eight years. Obviously, MIFID II has kicked in, ESG is kicking in. In the UK, uh, very closely attached to the minister that's um, writing the next paper on ESG. People don't know that there's going to be another tranche of ESG. So that's going to have an even bigger impact on board's react relationship with, with, with investor relations. So it, it has changed and I think it is continuing to change, which is why I think critically, um, because more and more sophisticated people like Aslan are coming into the world of investor relations. And those IR directors that have a level of ambition, a level of future um, power, because they're exposed to the CFO and to the CEO, the CEOs will say, oh, that person is great. That person should then become a director of strategy and director of, of corporate development, in, in some cases actually um, proxy CFOs. And what's interesting, is, again, as I said in my presentation, is, um, I mean, for instance, this year alone, I've worked on 32 IR mandates, and recently we 
worked with Vodafone to find a group director of IR, um, EasyJet to find a group director of the solutions. And what's really fascinating is the mandates that we got from the CFO and the CEO, which I went to the board meeting recently, and they said, we want someone that's happy to do IR for three years, but with, a poten with potential to move into a deputy CFO role. 10 years ago, or even eight years ago, that would never have been a criteria. And so therefore, we then have to go to the market and find people with CFAs and ACAs and banking qualifications and MBAs and who have the potential to become uh, the next generation of business leaders. And we, we found a perfect candidate for them last week. So that's great, great for us. But I think there definitely has been a shift in the reputation of IRs vis-a-vis -vis the board. But thank you for your question. I think there's a gentleman just here who wanted to, sorry. <laughs> Oscar Bay, thank you very much, My and pleasure. thank you for your vision in terms of uh, taking investor relations uh, quite a, a few steps higher. Uh, I am actually a veteran of investor relations uh, from quite long before, uh, in the startup years of EMs, uh, maybe. Uh, and I am currently a board member of Tweed, thanks to my colleagues here uh, for their respect and uh, care. Uh, and the founder of an EM company that is involved in sustainability uh, uh, through the EM world. Uh, I have sort of had the vision and feeling that uh, investor relations people should go up, especially in the EMs, to the level of independent board membership. Because ideally, I do take it that uh, two things. One is the information and knowledge base necessary, maybe. And the other is, uh, in fact, uh, the level of independence that an IR person can add to a company. I would like to take your view on that. Good. Thank you. Uh, I have to say, that's a, I mean, a brilliant question. The reason I'm really quite excited about answering this is, last Monday in London, we launched um, one of our reports. And the report uh, showcased a number of IR directors and corporate affairs directors that have transitioned into non-executive director roles, independent directorship roles. And that's so exciting that you have IR people who have been in IR for 10 or 15 years and answering this, this lady's question about wanting to remain in IR for a long period. You can remain in IR for a long period, but actually take all that experience and all, all that you've learned and advise boards about investor relations and their reputations vis-a-vis -vis the markets. So what's really exciting, so that's, that, that's a trend we picked up, David and I picked up in the UK three years ago, which is why we had this huge report. We launched it last month. We had 170 people in the room that came to the event that, 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 that showed to us that there was appetite for IR people who wanted to go onto boards. But to answer your question in a very long with fashion, I think what's really exciting is IROs need to understand that they have so much experience and so much credibility that they could go onto a board, onto another board externally and really help them not only gauge the, the relationship with the financial capital markets, but really advise them about their reputation. Uh, and, and I, Dave and I, we are confident, I can, I can bet my, my house on this, that in four or five years' time, there are going to be many more IR directors and corporate affairs directors that are going to sit on boards as NEDs externally. And to show, uh, we put um, Sue Clark, who, as I mentioned, was the former IR director corporate affairs director of SAB Miller. Now, she is a, one of the best IR directors ever. I mean, she's been doing IR for 30 years. She didn't want to go into business management after leaving SAB. So now she is a professional independent director. She now works on four of the world's biggest companies as a board director. Now, that was four years ago. That was, you would have laughed at me and taken me in a straight jacket and, again, given me 100 lashings um, to, say, to not say that. But that's happening in the UK, and it will happen. I think it's about actually as a... As a as a group having the confidence to say that you can advise boards on their reputation externally. So again, a very good question. I so hope that answers that. Right? Exactly, absolutely. But what's interesting is, yeah, you can have one or two examples of people that, that make, make, make that transition, but then you have people who want to make that transi transition, but don't know how to go about finding that journey, finding that path. So that's why Dave and I come in and we help them to navigate their, their, their career path. It's incredibly exciting.
My pleasure. All right, thank you. Um, IROs have a very diverse skill set. So what would be things that we need to do better in order to um, move into the business leadership role? And can you give some specific skills or experiences that we should bring along or work more on uh, in order to actually um, have our path made out? Thank you. Uh, thank you for a great question. I think, um, I mean, you do three, first, I think you do one of three things. You firstly um, become more sophisticated as an IR officer. So that means you need to have the confidence to read the balance sheets. And a lot of IROs can read balance sheets, that's a given. But actually running a business is about numbers as well. It's not just about organizational experience and um, group experience. It's about actually knowing what numbers mean and what, what, what happens there. And the common thread also from a lot of the, the people in the case study is that they, um, they all ha either had to have a CFA or an ACA or, or really had to make sure that they were very confident with numbers. That's, that's a first, that's a given. The second thing is actually becoming more commercially minded and actually knowing what's happening in the business. Really getting under the, going to spend some time with some of the business units, really finding out what's happening in that territory, what's happening in that department, what's happening in that country really getting under the skin of the organization. The third thing, which is really quite interesting, is that we, uh, one of the reports which we launched two years ago highlighted the transition from corporate affairs into business leadership. And there's one gentleman who, was, who became the CEO of Pearson PLC. And you probably won't, won't know, Pearson's one of the world's biggest publishers listed on the London Stock Exchange, worth about $30 billion. And uh, he started his career in corporate, corporate corporate affairs, and then he then said to his CFO, or his CEO, I really want to become a business leader, I don't know what to do. And the CEO said to him, well, what you need to do is go and run a business 400 miles away from London, a small part of the business, you need to run that, get some experience, and then come back to me, and then we can work on your career. And he said, well, I, I, I'm I sit right next to the I sit right next to you. I have uh, influence in the agenda. I have influence in the narrative. What am I going to do? He said, "Well, you need to go and run a business." And then he then dropped his ego, and he realised actually I do need to run a small part of the business, even though it was a small part of the business. He ran that for two years, three years. He gained a level of management experience and commercial experience, then came back to the centre to the HQ. And then he then became the CEO of Pearson PLC, one of the world's biggest companies. Now that is incredible. From a PR director to becoming the CEO of one of the world's biggest companies. But what he needed to do was realize that he needed to take three steps back to go five steps forward. A lot of ROs, a lot of corporate affairs directors can't do that because they think they've got to a certain, certain level in their, in their careers that they can't, the ego sort of kicks off and they can't really sort of let that go. You need to, if you're going to become You need to really have the experience of part of running a part of the business, as well as obviously the financial part and everything else like that. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, thank you for your inspiring uh, presentation uh, again. Pleasure. Um, my question is that regarding this transition, uh, have you observed any significant difference between uh, the trends in developed versus emerging uh, markets? Uh, have you, do you have any specific statistics for uh, countries? Uh, which countries are the most uh, <laughs> inclined ones for yeah. this transition? Again, that's another great question. Uh, that's going to be part of our global report next year, where we're going to assess countries, their understanding of IR, and their positioning of IR. And it's going to be interesting to see the difference from, say, Dubai to Hong Kong to um, Paris to Turkey, and seeing what the difference, difference is. I don't think Turkey is... Um, I think Turkey is way ahead developed more than a lot of countries in their investigations capabilities. Um, but we will 
launch that report next year, and I'd be delighted to share that with you, and we'll go through the individual numbers next year. But I have to say, my final point is, you guys are so sophisticated here. It's really, really blown me away. And uh, again, I mentioned at the at the start, having, <laughs> having, uh, I, I don't know why I'm laughing, but so having worked on the IPO and the privatisation of Turkcell 20 years ago, and really seeing from nothing, the first kernel of IR in Turkey, to, to seeing all of you in this room and to knowing Aslı and Ilkay Hanım and, and others, I think it showcases that Turkey is definitely advanced. But, uh, but we'll share that report with you sometime next year. I'm looking forward to that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just want to wrap up the questions in preparation for the next session. And I see no more hands. So great insights. And I hope we'll have a lot more examples for you in terms of, you know, the um, road from IR to CEO or senior management from Turkey. Bir sonraki seans için şimdi hazırlanmak üzere sahneyi arkadaşlarınıza... Thank you very much Mr. Oscar Yaşar. Evet Sayın Oscar Yaşar'a çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Bir güçlü alkış rica ediyorum kendileri için. Thank you very much for your kind contributions. Sayın Aslı Selçuk'a da çok teşekkür ediyoruz bu e, güzel sohbet için ve elbette sizlere de sorularınız için teşekkür ediyoruz. 